We've talked a lot about the importance of images to the reader's cognitive simulation of a story. In the opening lesson to this story world section, I mentioned that a good way to think of a story is as a series of viewpoint-centered images arranged in a particular temporal sequence. From this series of images, a larger sense of a complete story world takes hold in the reader's mind, but some images matter more than others. Some images stick. This fact may also harken back to our discussion of the importance of memory and its relationship to images and stories. You can't completely remember a story the way you experienced it as you read it. There's far too much information. It's one of the main reasons we write stories down. But even reading the same story again and again will produce a slightly different experience each time. The memory of the experience of reading a story will inevitably become blurrier and blurrier as time passes. And I've found that even with really great stories, what I'm left with at the end are a few vivid images that call the story to mind once the reading experience has ended. These are the types of images I'm talking about here, the images that last in the reader's mind, lingering in the memory, carrying baggage to be reopened at a later time. I like to think of these types of images as a sort of freeze frame in the cognitive simulation that burns itself into the reader's memory. How do great writers accomplish the presentation of a vivid, lasting image? I've found no scholarship on this phenomenon, which isn't to say that it's not out there, but I haven't been made aware of it. Nor have I read much about this from writers by way of practical advice, except the usual observation that great writers do this. Or, sometimes writers or scholars may ponder the aspects of a striking image in isolation. Unfortunately, I found the discussion so far on this topic isn't particularly satisfying in terms of creating a lesson plan for students to learn this skill. Thus, I've developed this lesson as a starting point I hope will be helpful as both a tool for students and a jumping-off point for narrative theorists. I'd like to start this discussion with a tip of the cap to the fiction writer's closest cousins in the verbal arts, the poets. Poetry, especially modern poetry, is extremely image-centric. In fact, if I were to draw a few distinctions between the two art forms, the major quality that distinguishes a poem would be the absence of suspense generated in a grammatical plot, followed by the importance of the line and meter. The greatest commonality, though, would be the importance of images, and poets are great at generating a striking image in an extremely economical way, so there's quite a lot to learn about generating images from poets. I'm going to present a couple poems as points of analysis to see what we can learn from a poet's approach to imagery. We'll draw a few conclusions from these poems, as well as a couple from fictional stories to generate some guidelines to help fiction writers craft lasting images. So here goes. The following poem by William Stafford is titled At the Bomb Testing Site. At noon in the desert, a panting lizard waited for history, its elbows tense, watching the curve of a particular road as if something might happen. It was looking at something farther off than people could see, an important scene, acted in stone, for little selves at the flute end of consequences. There was just a continent without much on it, under a sky that never cared less, ready for a change. The elbows waited. The hands gripped hard on the desert. We can look at several points in the text of the poem to get a sense of how Stafford is crafting an image. First, you might notice in the opening line that he follows the familiar ground figure order, offering, in the desert, a panting lizard. So the reader has a place to put that lizard in their mind's eye, a solid move. That the lizard is panting also sets the scene in motion, albeit slightly. He mentions tense elbows to go with the panting and finishes the stanza with a further tension-building phrase, as if something might happen. This image of a lizard staring into the distance of a lonely desert road, unaware of the looming explosion, presents a heavily loaded image that contrasts the potential destructiveness and self-importance of the human world with the ignorant and indifferent natural world going on about its business under a sky that never cared less. The poem returns the focus to the familiar elbows of the lizard and offers a tactile image, the hands gripping the desert, to leave the listener or reader with the same strong visual image of the lone lizard in the open desert, clutching the earth. There's a lot to like about how Stafford crafted such a vivid image. Okay, let's try one more. Here's an excerpt from Mary Oliver's poem, The Black Snake. When the black snake flashed onto the morning road, 
and the truck could not swerve. Death. That is how it happens. Now he lies looped and useless as an old bicycle tire. I stop the car and carry him into the bushes. He is as cool and gleaming as a braided whip. He is as beautiful and quiet as a dead brother. I leave him under the leaves. I have a bit of a reptile theme going, and sure enough, they're on similar ground, a road. This time, instead of getting bombed, the snake gets run over. I love the comparison of the dead snake to an old bicycle tire and later a braided whip. This helps to solidify the image of the snake in my mind. Again, the presence of a well-defined ground, the road, helps me to visualize the dead snake on the road. And movement along a pathway from the road to the leaves only aids in my effort to generate an image of this dead snake along this roadway. Each of these poems only offers the reader 60 or 70 words with which to form an image, yet they're both quite evocative. How does the poet do this? First, I've noted the importance of an explicitly defined ground, a desert near a road in the first poem, and a road near the bushes in the second poem. That helps facilitate a scene in the reader's mind. This is important. For an image to last in the reader's mind, it must be vivid to begin with, and it's hard to be vivid without a clear setting to visualize. Second, note the amount of schematic material the writers are calling up. In the first poem, the desert, the road, the rocks, the lizard, etc., while the second poem evokes a snake, a road, a truck, bushes, and all these items are schematic, unspecified. Yet both poets highlight details they draw the reader's focus to specifically. In the first poem, Stafford cues the reader to focus on the lizard's elbows and its hands gripping the floor of the desert. In the second poem, it's a pair of visual metaphors, the bicycle tire and the braided whip. These precise cues call the reader to alter their schematic renderings in a very specific way. It isn't that the language in these poems is ornate or elaborate. In fact, you might call the language plain, but the way in which both poets alter the schematic imagery is what gives these scenes their unique image-defining force. Long story short, if you have a reptile on a road, you've got yourself a winning poem. But seriously, there are a couple of generalizations we can draw from these and other poems that will be useful in forming a set of guidelines that can help fiction writers to poach these effective image-creating moves of our poet cousins. These poets make use of a ground so that the image has a place to live. They also offer an important focus, something of consequence to live on that ground. And they alter schematic material with a few unique details that cue a specific rendering of the image. And because they're poets, they do it in a short word count, in stanzas, and with a cadence and rhythm appropriate to poetry. Additionally, both poems have narrative elements to them especially the second, where actions unfold in a specific temporal progression. We can add to these ideas a couple of important elements from fictional narratives, a pause in the narration, as well as the image's place in the story, to complete a set of five characteristics common to lasting images from fictional stories. I offer these commonalities not as requirements for a lasting image, but they do appear frequently. You might not need to check every box to create a lasting image, but an image that possesses four of these five qualities stands a better chance of building a lasting image in the reader's mind than an image formed only with one. Here they are in full. 1. The image has a frame for it to live in. That is, there's a clear ground, perhaps even with borders, that presents a platform for the image to stand upon. 2. The image is an important element to the story that calls readers to focus on and remember it. It's critical to the story. 3. The text calls attention to specific details using descriptive language in that moment, both calling on schematic material and deviating from those schematic cues in exacting ways. 4. The narrative seems to pause, and often does so in the narrative sense, presenting the image through a pause in duration more linking than action verbs. Time stops. The lasting image appears concurrent with the most important moment or moments in the plot of the story, a major fork in the road, the climax, or the end. With those five points in hand, we'll examine a couple lasting images from short stories that make use of many of these points to create staying power. The following is an excerpt from Nathan Englander's story, How We Avenge the Blooms. 
This story is about a group of Jewish boys who are being terrorized by a bully they call the Anti-Semite. In an effort to get back at the Anti-Semite for the way they've been mistreated, the boys seek out the help of the toughest Jew they know, Ace Cohen, and they convince a reluctant Ace to fight the Anti-Semite for them. For the record, I highly recommend reading the story in its entirety before spoiling it with this passage. Go do that now. Spoilers begin. The climactic fight ends with one mighty punch from Ace Cohen. He, the anti-Semite, caught it right on the chin. He took it without rocking back, an exceptional feat, even before we knew that his jaw was broken. He remained stock still for a second or two. Not a bit of him moved except for that bottom jaw which had unhinged like a snake's and made a solid quarter turn to the side. Then he dropped. Ace pushed his way through the circle we'd formed. It closed right back up around the anti-Semite, bloodied and now writhing before us. As I watched him, I knew I'd always feel that to be broken was better than to break. My failing. I also knew that the deep rumble rolling through us was only nerves a sensitivity to imagined repercussion, as if a sound were built into revenge. What we really shared in that instance was simple. Anyone who stood with us that day will tell you the same. With the anti-Semite at our feet, confusion came over us all. We stood there, looking at that crushed boy, and none of us knew when to run. The first of the five points we highlighted is present here, the frame. In this case, the boys themselves create the frame inside the larger ground of the park where this fight unfolds. But Englander's narrator cleverly calls attention to this frame in a way that seems organic to the story. Ace pushed his way through the circle we'd formed. It closed right back up around the anti-Semite, bloodied and now writhing before us. So the reader is cued to visualize this circle of boys surrounding the anti-Semite as he lay on the ground within the circle they'd made around him. This image is key to the plot of the story. It's the very embodiment of the revenge the boys spend the entire story seeking. And Englander does call up both schematic material to visualize, a punch bully, but he also alters it in a specific and unique way. That bottom jaw which had unhinged like a snake's and made a solid quarter turn to the side. It's not a particularly poetic image, but it is unique and immediately evocative of the anti-Semite's specific injury when placed on a human avatar. And in that moment, the narration pauses. The final two paragraphs of the story are almost completely atemporal. It's as though the narrator hits the pause button to leave the moment on a freeze frame, while he and the readers contemplate the potential meaning of this almost uncanny moment, where the revenge they sought is fulfilled before them, and is simultaneously more grotesque than they ever could have known. Finally, it is the ultimate moment in the story. It's placed right at the most significant event, so that the reader is left with this image as they ponder the story upon its completion. It's a mesmerizing moment in this story, and when I think of stories that leave me with a lasting image, this is one of the stories that immediately comes to mind. It's vivid and has burned itself into my memory, largely, I suspect, because the narrator hits all five points we mentioned with the type of fierce efficiency that Englander's work is so replete with. Here's a look at a different type of vivid image from another great short story writer, Rick Bass. And again, I implore you to read the story before I spoil it here. The story, Fires, involves a male narrator named Joe who lives deep in rural Montana and has spent the summer accompanying a beautiful long-distance runner named Glenda whom he cycles behind with a gun to protect her from the grizzly bears that often appear on the isolated roads she trains on. They've fallen in love but have resisted the urge to get together because neither of them wants to face the end of the summer when Glenda leaves Montana to compete in races all over the world. On her final day in Montana, she inexplicably sets a fire in Joe's field that quickly burns out of control. They run for safety into the small pond in Joe's backyard. It was just a grass fire, but the heat was intense as it rushed toward us, blasting our faces with the hot winds. It was terrifying. We ducked our heads under the water to cool our drying faces and splashed water on each other's shoulders. Birds were flying past us, and grasshoppers and small mice were diving into the pond with us where hungry trout were rising and snapping at them, swallowing them like corn. It was growing dark and there were flames all around us. 
We could only wait and see if the grass was going to burn itself up as it swept past. Please, love, Glenda was saying, and I did not understand at first that she was speaking to me. Please. We had moved out into the deepest part of the pond, chest deep and having to duck beneath the surface because of the heat. Our lips and faces were blistering. Pieces of ash were floating down on the water like snow. It was not until nightfall that the flames died down, just a few orange ones flickering here and there. But all the rest of the small field was black and smoldering and still too hot to walk across barefooted. The frame in this scene isn't quite as explicit as Englander's, but it's not entirely absent either. The small pond itself has a border, and even if the shore isn't a clear enough boundary, the presence of the smoke certainly hems the two characters into a specific place in the story world. Joe and Glenda together in the water are the most important elements in the story. Their kindling relationship is the focus of the entire plot, and their confinement in such close proximity forces them together and forces the reader to picture them there with a literal hot fire and cool water enfolding them in a battle for survival, all while their figurative romance is enduring the same struggle between hot and cold. Schematic material here are the characters, the small pond, the water, and the animals. But Bass's narrator points to several specific pointed details to create a unique image. The fish swallowing up the grasshoppers and small mice, like corn, and the ash floating down onto the water like snow. The scene doesn't exactly pause because it spans an unspecified but not insignificant time. Yet within that time, it does seem to pause for them. They're stuck as the birds rush past and the ash flutters to the surface of the pond. They're left there clutching each other as they hope for the fire to pass them by unharmed. It's placed at the climax of the story. This is the resolution to the summer-long love affair that was always waiting to be kindled. The story doesn't end here exactly, but the main plot is resolved, and all that remains is the narrator's attempt to come to terms with Glenda's departure the following day. It's such a simple, elegant story from an equally elegant writer, and what a resounding image it presents the reader to carry with them. Those are merely two. I'd suggest you seek out some of the images from stories that have burned themselves into your memory. Look for the five points I highlighted above. Not all the lasting images I've examined explicitly fulfill all five of these points, but most hit four solidly, and many do hit five. An important point I learned in developing this lesson is that great writers rarely overcook things to generate a lasting scene, because you don't have to. The combination of schematic material plus a few unique details is usually more than enough to call a startlingly vivid image to the reader's mind's eye with surprising efficiency. And we might as well make that a closing point on space and place in the story world. We've covered all the different ways your reader will process spatializing cues, including ways to generate the most and least immersive environments. Your reader's imagination is your best friend as it doesn't take much to evoke a vivid story world for them to experience in rich detail, most of which they'll provide on their own. Space is all too often the forgotten element of written fiction, but with the tools we've explored in this section in hand, you now have the knowledge to ensure your story world space is as rich or as sparse as you care to make it. So give your readers an experience they'll never forget by taking them places they can only go in a book.